Sarah Burgess, you're nominated for, uh, by the Writers Guild for Impeachment, the third season of the anthology series American Crime Story. Uh, this season rec recounts the sex scandal involving Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky, but in this case, Lewinsky herself is a producer. Uh, so what was it like writing her story with the woman herself actually attached to it? Um, it was terrifying. It was nerve wracking. Um, I, uh, I will never forget the first moment I met her, which was after, I think I'd written three scripts at that point. So it was an unusual process because I did have the sort of freedom to go and create this character, this version based on the Monica that I had observed in all of the just barrage of media from that time and uh, her interviews and her book, Monica Story. Um, and then um, one day we met and then we were in a creative process and she would give me detailed notes on every page of my scripts and, and we started to develop a relationship in many phases like sometimes zoom meetings sometimes uh written notes and things like that um all culminating in a, a really nice um lunch that i had with her a couple of months ago here in new york which uh which was really great so it was it was a intense um creative process and terrifying at times but uh, really rewarding too and and once you had met her uh, how did that uh you know, affect or influence your characterization of her as you were writing her in the show? I mean, it's so interesting because you're meeting someone, of course, a couple of decades after the events. So her her current insights about some of it were really gave gave some some depth and like uh, perspective. But also I was my job was to write truthfully this person in her early 20s, you know, so I um, the way Monica spoke then and the way she spoke uh, a year or two ago when we met, I would see resonances, her speech patterns like really inspired me. Um, and of course she was, I mean, I can't tremendously um, helpful for things like verisimilitude, but also explaining what she, her inner life, which, you know, I, I sort of took this job. I was excited to write this, to explore Monica's inner life and the inner life of Linda Tripp and what happened in that relationship, that friendship that went horribly awry. Um, so it was, uh, it, it, it certainly affected the character and, and the story that I told. Um, and of course, this was one of the most uh, reported stories in a, like entirely of American history. Uh, so <laughs> yeah. like when you're dealing with that much material, so much that people already do know historically about what happened during that time, uh, what were you hoping to to bring to it as you know, this fresh lens on uh, on the, the matter? That's a good question. Um, I think I felt, it, I, you know, I, I felt very aware of all of the real history that I had to match and threading the needle of writing something, as you said, like the events were so familiar to so much of the audience. Um, I think I felt that what had not been done was a story that put yourself in, for example, Monica's shoes in like episode six when the FBI um, and the OIC holds Monica in a hotel room, sort of walk her, walk in her shoes as she's, you know, what would it feel like to be held there and to feel that time, like sort of that time elapsing and like the, the terror of that moment. It had been written about in FBI reports, it had been covered, it had been fought about in Congress. You know, Ken Starr got very testy about it when he was pressed about it. That, I guess the interiority of that moment and working with an actor to sort of create create those moments, um, to feel the passage of time, to feel the terror of that, I suppose, for example, um, that event, that was something that, that was something that I felt was sort of my job to do and inspired me um, to, to pursue this. And also in a similar way, to feel the sort of emotional state of Linda Tripp as she built up to making the choices that she did to, to record those calls with Monica and everything, to sit with her in the sort of quiet of her life and in her frustration. That was something that I felt um, could add to the, the history and the conversation, I guess. Uh, and another thing that uh, you know makes this uh, particular telling of the story stand out is I feel like you know pop culture ha uh, tree has treated uh, certain women uh, in 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 history very unkindly, and we're at this moment where we're starting to reevaluate that. Whether it's Marsha Clark in in uh, People versus O.J. Simpson, uh, or Monica Lewinsky, or Tammy Faye Baker, or you know uh, 
Britney Spears. Um, you know, so so getting to tell this story from the point of view of women who have, as often in, you know, than not been parodied, um, and now getting to see them as more full human beings, like how was that to kind of explore them in that way? I feel like my job was to be truthful, not only about the real events, but also, like I said, about sort of the inner lives of these people. And these are complicated people actually going through pretty bad times in their lives, whether we're talking about Monica or Linda, Paula and Hillary Clinton. Like these are people who are not, you know, these are not women in, in the middle of, at that time, these are not women in the middle of necessarily inspiring stories. So I like the challenge of writing about some of the desperation and the pain and the panic and the, the rage um, to write about that in a way that, you know, I to, felt truthful to me and, you know, didn't necessarily shy away from all the rough edges of those uh, human experiences. Um, because that's the most human thing to me, you know, it's not necessarily always a, a positive, you know, um, this is not a story of triumph, I guess you would say, as you said, it's an example of history landing on someone quite heavily and our culture landing on them heavily. So I love the challenge of, you know, expressing and exploring the pain and, and anger of those moments, um, giving those screen time, whether it's a secretary with very little power or the first lady, you know, putting them on a level playing field with the president um, and letting people draw their own conclusions. But hopefully what they're seeing is these little, sometimes not very glamorous, um, wonderful experiences of these people and, and seeing how, um, it, it, seeing sort of the, the depth of emotion that led to some of those choices and some of that pain, if that makes sense, you know? Um, but I felt that the tension between that truthfulness and also wanting to make sure, you know, the awareness, if you want people to feel good about them, um, good about these people too, and to somewhat correct the record about, because as you said, it's, these are not people who deserve to be treated with as, as jokes, and they were at that time. Uh, and of course, there's uh, so much uh, material here, so many characters and events to wrap your arms around with this. Uh, what what kind of research was involved uh, to kind of create the most uh, authentic portrait of what happened at the time? There are like a million books about this event, you know, so I read a lot of them. Um, you know, I, a, a few of them sort of became touchstones for me, but, you know, so, even Ken Starr wrote a book, you know, so many of these people actually had their own stories told. Both Clintons did memoirs that, of course, don't go into this in depth. Um, so I, you know, I, I like doing research as a parallel process to finding the voice of her character. So I think that the first voice that became clear to me was that of Linda Tripp. Um, Ken Gormley has this great book, Death of American Virtue, which, which has interviews with Linda, which was helpful, um, as were her, was her interview with Slow Burn. Um, so I took in all that material. There's also a lot of, uh, you know, FBI documents and congressional reports that I read. Um, I, um, then of course had Monica herself was the only real person that I spoke to. Um, uh, we, we, me and the writer spoke to him working on this. So I, you know, I, I saw it as my job to take all of that in. And often I, you know, at a certain point, I, the job was sort of something that I, it was mentioned as a possibility for me. You know, did I want to pursue this job? And what ha what happened to me is the thing that happens, which I just at a certain point fell for the story and just felt like I had to write it. And I loved the challenge of these complicated, uh, these very complicated people. Um, whose voices I was hearing in, in these primary source reports and in the books, and I, I decided I had to write it. So I took in everything that I could, because as you say, I knew that I, I wanted to take it all in. And I also knew that much of the audience would also you know, know the material um, very well, which is an unusual position for a writer to be in. Uh, and you know the way you uh, conclude this story at the end of the series uh, is on a very interesting note. It's, it's a scene of Monica uh, at a book signing and she's overwhelmed. Um, you know, what, what made you sort of want to enter there? Had you always thought of that as sort of the ending note, this moment where she's overwhelmed by all the intention and she says, I'm be, gonna be okay, you know? I had not always intended to end there. I think I was, I, what I, I think I, what I had always intended and what I was always very interested in was Monica's life in New York immediately after these events. And the real Monica, this human being who exists in the world, like all of us, having to contend with this second Monica in the world, this public persona who was created and as you said, sort of mocked and um, played as a joke across the world and you know had conspiracy theories about her. And so I was interested in finding a moment, I, I guess I'll say this, what I didn't wanna do was end this story on 
a false note of positivity at that time. It felt important to end the story in 99, right after it happened. And as you said, this is a, you know, this is a situation where um, a lot of, I would say sort of ancient misogyny was tearing this young woman apart. And I think to express someone who's trying to exist, who kind of has no place in the world she can go, is trying to exist, is trying to move forward through time as we all are. And yet she is seen by the entire, almost, almost the entire world around her as this other um, person, this other thing, this idea. Um, and so I think that in sort of grappling with episode 10, the final episode, um, you know, I think in working with my producer, Brad Simpson, sort of talking through a ton of different ideas, we sort of, I think, became very interested in um, this video of Monica doing a signing at Harrods in Britain, um, which, you know, it's a fascinating thing to watch, which shows like a, a ton of, uh, a giant crowd of uh, Brits sort of screaming her name at her and her being a little overwhelmed. And it felt like the, there was something in that moment that conveyed the agony of, of, uh, of that time in Monica's life. Um, and the fascination with her and her, you know, having to sort of, again, continue to exist as this sort of as two people, the, the real her and the second her who exists in the real world, in the, in the public sphere. Well, uh, congratulations on uh, impeachment and on your Writers Guild nomination for it. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Yeah, thank you. You too, Daniel. Carrie Aaron, you're the showrunner for The Morning Show, for which you're nominated for two Writers Guild Awards this year. Uh, the circumstances around writing the season were unique, to say the least. <laughs> um, you started production, then the COVID lockdowns happened, and then you reworked the season to incorporate COVID. Uh, so how complex was that creative process of bringing this kind of world altering event into the show as it was happening all sort of in real time? I mean, it was, it was a lot of work and it was, I, I think though, once you get on, once you get a, a concept for how you're going to do it, then you're just executing it. Um, and that was not really harder than any other season of television it was a little bit harder because we were all exhausted <laughs> because we had just written almost a whole season so uh but we you know we rolled up our sleeves and and no one knew what was going to happen then we were all in quarantine and so it was in a way it was a very bonding thing to do uh, and, and to do it, uh, you know, not only as this thing is happening, but as we're learning about it in real time, yeah. you know, our understanding of COVID and how it worked yeah. and how it operated and how it spread was still evolving. Uh, what, what, were you, was that like a learning process throughout as, as things were going along? It was. And um, I mean, that's sort of one of the challenges of this show in particular is that you are writing about current events and yet it's going to air a year later. So it's, you're always a little bit rolling the dice and uh, hoping you get close, you know, but it, it is, it's, it's tricky. Um, we chose because of that to focus on a part of the pandemic that was earlier. So we, we could analyze it a little bit better, although we were still so close to it, it was hard to have any scope, you know, on, on analyzing it, but um, it was interesting really to, to work on it, to see um, it, to see it unfolding as we went. Uh, and, you know, as you're adjusting the story, are there, you know, pieces or, or story developments that you cut out or stuff that you'll maybe work into future seasons like are, are, are there pieces that we're gonna get to see later or like what was that like uh there there is always a million things that you leave behind always uh and you know how that plays out um you really, you really never know, but yeah, there was some good stuff that we had to leave out uh, to to re, you know, retrofit it for for the COVID storyline. Uh, and one of the uh, aspects of the season that uh, was uh, interesting was the way you continued Mitch's story uh, after what happened in uh, season one. Obviously, him being fired, the allegations. Um, 
how how did that change or or was that more or less sort of to plan what uh what you had in mind for that the i'm sorry can you say that one more time the uh question? yeah I, yeah i was wondering uh if if uh your plan for you know continuing the mitch's storyline uh was uh you know so more or less what you envisioned or if that also uh changed uh mm. over the course of adjusting the story Uh, yeah, we always wanted to to finish that story with with Alex uh, because it really was the foundation of where she began in the in the beginning of the show. Um, you know how her life changed when he was fired, when the scandals came out, um, all the stuff that that really re um, reset the, her whole world. Uh, and it felt important to get her to a place of closure uh, and to finish his story as well. Uh, and, you know, speaking of which, your uh, one of your nominations uh, is for episodic drama for specifically uh, his final uh, episode, uh, La Mar Vita, yeah. uh, where Alex visits him in Italy, um, and very much a, a two-hander for a lot of that between the two of them. Yeah. Uh, what was it like to write that and, and sort of want to get that, uh, you know, as as this kind of closure point for the two characters? It was it was hard. Um, I wrote that with um, Scott Troy, uh, who's on our staff. Um, and and we did a lot of different drafts uh, because it's such a <clears throat> it's such a delicate, <laughs> obviously, uh, subject and area. It meant a lot. Um, it meant a lot to both of the characters, and you know, just wanting to get it right um, to not be overly, to not in any way be be overly sympathetic or or um, forgiving, but to also just bite into the complicated, fucked up nature of loving somebody or having loved somebody who is capable of doing bad things and also that person's journey of looking at that you know the per the the person who committed the crimes uh their journey of looking at that and how honest they can be with themselves and um how how that gets processed um it's an old it's an old story, you know, Crime and Punishment was one of my favorite uh, books that I read in college. Uh, and it's all the story of um, a murderer, basically, who looks at why he did what he did and if there's any redemption and if he can change. And um, I think I think exile is is an interesting subject. Um, and, you know, spoiler alert for anyone who hasn't seen it, but the, the way that episode ends is, is Mitch, uh, you know, is driving on the road and, you know, sort of veers off and lets his sort of car go off the road and, and, and that's how he dies. Uh, did, was that an ending you always envisioned for him or did you kind of discover that along the way? Yeah, it was just an instinct for a bunch of different reasons. Um, but I, I think in part, his story is all about him not being able to come to terms with who he is and what he's done. Um, and that seemed an appropriate ending. Um, and, you know, after that, uh, you know, you have uh, Alex uh, actually contracting COVID and, and, and sort of broadcasting her experience with that. Uh, you know, did that feel like in a way you're not just doing that for the fictional audience of Alex Levy in the show, but sort of almost for the viewing audience at home to kind of see and and get a sense of COVID in this personal way. I mean, that was part of it. I, the larger, the larger part of it, to to me, was about um, like shoving her into such a um, physical hell that it really um, just sort of melted her 
that she that she she goes into the fire um, of this fever and she comes out a different person um, and she is sort of stripped of all of the all of the guards we all put up all the time all of the walls uh, you know all of the self judgment all of the outside judgment um, that she just gets down to something that's very um, what her true feelings are. And I think for me, this show has always been about um, my relationship with the industry. I mean, it is always, there's always been an aspect of that in it for me. Um, from when I took, when I stepped in um, and it was, you know, they needed to get it in production pretty quickly. And I, it wasn't something I had a ton of time to research. Um, we all hit the ground running and I very much pulled the personal stories out of myself <laughs> because that's what I had to work with. And, it, and it, to me, it was always about sort of the fakery of the industry, the um, people having these um, mirage illusions of what happiness, fame or success brings. It was really looking at all of that with a, with a, with both drama and a sense of humor. But to me, that is where she landed as a more authentic version of herself, where she wasn't trying to be the good girl and she wasn't trying to please anyone. And she wasn't, she was just tired of trying. <laughs> and she just was like, this is who I am. And I'm gonna try to be the best person I can be. Uh, well, congratulations on uh, the show. Uh, congratulations on being renewed for season three. Uh, hopefully there is not another cataclysm that will force you to rewrite it. <laughs> um, uh, and and uh, thank you for joining me. Uh, it, yes, and I um, thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Thanks. John Hoffman, you co-created the comedy series Only Murders in the Building, uh, and now you're nominated for three Writers Guild Awards. Uh, first off, how did you come together with Steve Martin to create this kind of uh, comic whodunit? Uh, it was at the most good fortune moment of my life. Um, Dan Fogelman, uh, I spoke with Dan Fogelman and his producing partner, Jess Rosenthal, uh, with their company and they came to me and they said we need someone to meet with uh steve martin he has an idea and we need someone to consider co-creating and show running a show uh for him and marty short at that time it was just the two of them that we knew were going to be involved and i thought well you don't say no to that uh, i was very intimidated but um i immediately started spinning on a bunch of ideas for it uh the idea that steve had and then we met for dinner and I was uh, immediately uh, confronted with someone who was completely gracious, open and generous. And um, I thought, oh, this could really work. And it's been nothing but that since Steve has been amazing. Uh, and the whole group around us has been incredible to sort of uh, all see the same thing pretty quickly. Uh, and what's that collaboration like for that, like, you know, for that first episode, is it, you know, are you working really hand in hand the whole time or do you take a pass and does he take a pass or what was that like? It was uh, very much a uh, meeting with Steve, um, uh, both in LA and then he invited me to New York and, and spend time to work and craft out and I would pitch and sort of lay out a first pilot uh, story. And we started to go back and forth then and say okay here here through you know what about this what about this and i love the process so much because um it felt like we were i knew that the hope was that we would do something unexpected or not as expected maybe um when you hear the pitch on this one and you think of who's in it and uh but when you think of who's in it really with steve and marty i thought you know the elevated a comedic material is what I was aiming for. And, and you know, they're incredible dramatic actors as well as comedic actors. And so um, I thought there was a landscape there that was potentially fresh um, within this uh, true crime comedy mystery format. And uh, it wasn't uh, long before Steve was immediately engaged in the various leaps we take uh, with the show. And that wasn't surprising because he's been doing that all his career. But um, 
And so that was really lovely and welcoming and became a very fertile comedic uh, and but also dramatic uh, landscape to work in with him. And we went back and forth. I would do a draft. I would send the draft. He would send notes back. We would have conversations back and forth. He would do things. He would make adjustments, things like that. It was a brilliant partnership. I, I could not have loved anything more. And still to this day, every I get one sentence emails from Steve Martin. He writes them in one sentence. And it's just notions and ideas and reflections on a line or something like that. But I get six or seven of them a day. So um, it's fantastic. Uh, and another uh, interesting thing about this story, of course, is that it's a mystery. Uh, and I'm always interested in the writing of mysteries because it feels so much like architecture in a way where you're where you're putting pieces together and they have to fit or the whole thing collapses. Uh, like, what? Well, how how was it a challenge to kind of know the structure of this mystery and how it would unfold uh, from episode to episode, scene to scene? Uh, what, what was that uh, thought process? You know, I've been listening to the other writers you've been talking to, and they're all brilliant. And, and I, I, they've all said the same thing. You know, yeah, it was hard. Um, and and I, I appreciate that so much. It's my love for writers where I'm like, immediately like, it's hard. It's really hard, all of it. A mystery has particular things that are difficult. A mystery comedy is another thing that makes it a little bit challenging. And then, you know, trying to find the balance is the real challenge. And I have a, you know, a, within the partnership with Dan Fogelman on this and Steve, and then this brilliant room of writers that I work with every day was quick uh, to realize that, um, you know, the whole mystery arc over 10 episodes would have to go start in our minds from backward to forward. So we had to do where we were aiming and figure everything else out, twist our way to the end and then work backwards. And then we could start writing the second episode. Now I had the first episode laid out and a pretty good structural track for the three seat, three acts of the season. But um, boy, did I need a lot of help with, with sort of sorting out um, the details and keeping track. And that's a fun thing, but I sort of demystified it a little bit because I realized a lot of the scripts I'd worked on before this, they were all kind of mysteries. Whenever you work on a story, you're always burying things and revealing things. And whether it's an actual mystery you're doing or not, um, I, I kind of was able to sort of write it without being too intimidated by the form uh, to, uh, you know, sort of allow myself the freedom to say, I can do this, I can do this mystery, even though I've never done a mystery before in my life. Uh, and as you mentioned, doing a, a mystery comedy uh, has its own uh, challenges. Uh, what, what, was, what were the thoughts going into balancing, uh, you know, a murder story with uh, that sort of human uh, or, you know, humorous and, and also human element uh, where you're uh, learning about these characters? You know, it's all about, for me, it's about the human connection, right? So the human connection in the way into the story for me is humor. It always is. Typically, and, and when I write, I, I can't help myself but try to come in from that direction because it just feels like the most connective tissue to people. You open people up, you watch people open up, you let them sort of chop each other down with a good line or two. Um, and here we have, uh, with Selena as well, who was the big surprise in the trio for me, of how well they all mix together in that generational gap and the way in which the humor can live and breathe in some, I think, hope, fresh way uh, that we maybe didn't expect or see coming. Um, think also though, just the nature of having um, Steve and Marty who, you know, it's so the vein of humor and, and brilliant comedy is in their veins. And, and if you can sort of ride that wave, you know, you've got that part of it. Um, and if, you know, I, I have this lexicon and, and understanding as we all do of Steve and Marty's career um, in my ears. So it's, it's not hard to sort of imagine these, them as these characters and sort of threading through. And once we've got a good plot and a good structure, um, what they might say that disarms a typical mystery structure throughout all three of them, uh, that felt really fun um, to play around with once we had the big structure. Um, and, you know, uh, mysteries in particular have such a, 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 a important relationship with the audience because, you know, you're trying to lead them to a place that, you know, the audience is going to feel like makes sense, but isn't maybe necessarily the most predictable, uh, like, did you have people like as the season, the episodes were airing, like people who came to you, like they figured it out, they, 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 they knew where it was going, uh, uh, and, and how, how do you feel when someone figures it out before the season gets there? 
it was so fascinating that process to have people responding you know you go on twitter but also you get a message or you know from your brother-in-law who's like it's teddy don't tell me um and, and i'm like okay i i don't I, I, you know whatever episode they're on and they're guessing and all of that so that was really fun i was amazed you know there's bigger communities who really got into the show and uh started theorizing about it and i thought well that's really clever what they're talking about we didn't do that but we've got something else so it was going to be an interesting like tightrope walk to sort of see how everyone was going to react and um one of the big things there's one really big clue that comes up in episode nine at the very end of episode nine that is planted in episode two and that one was when i was sort of stressed out about the whole time like oh my god if someone knows what this is and if we show it in episode two does that give the whole thing away before we reach where we want to reach and that was the thing i was mainly tracking and I think it was a Reddit board or something like that that came up, you know, with what it was about five days before uh, it aired that episode nine. So I thought, wow, if we got this far before that dropping a little bit, just in that little big world of Reddit boards, but um, it was uh, gratifying to know that it didn't it didn't leak or break or no one picked up on it until then. And I was really happy with the feeling of, of uh, you know, and in the mystery, you're always going to have sort of different feelings about whether, you know, that was satisfying or not. But I think on, on the whole, I was delighted by um, the response to the mystery story in our in our piece. I think that's the other thing, hopefully, that might have surprised people. Um, and, you know, you've been renewed for a second season um, and you've, you know, basically teased. <laughs> <laughs> I've been Marty Short's trailer. He's going to walk in here any minute with a sandwich for lunch. Just by the way, <laughs> uh, but he like teased the 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 second season mystery all the way from the first scene in season one. Um, right. You know, do you have a lot of ideas like sort of back up like you know for like seasons three, four, five, and six? Do you have like this whole like basket of ideas that you uh, already have sort of formulating? Yes, I think of um, there's a. Uh, great Broadway actress, Elaine Stritch, used to say she can't remember lines uh, from a bad play. Um, and I can't have a lot of ideas or write well from a bad idea. So this idea felt very much like, oh my, I can't stop thinking of ideas on this one. And it's also the blessing of like incredible people that are doing this show um, all around, backstage, front stage, everywhere. Um, but in this case, the... Um, embrace also of the approach we took with the material and expanding it in sort of like you know imaginative ways hopefully um that just all feels like the most delightful experience to sort of go oh what about what about what about what about and then you unschool that uh it's easy to get to many seasons if we are so lucky uh, well, con yeah, congratulations on this season of the show and the next season you're currently working on um, and potentially several seasons after that. Uh, it's been a, and of course, congratulations on the Writers Guild nominee. Oh, I'm so thrilled by those. Thank you so much, Daniel. It's really nice to talk to you. Drew Michael, you're nominated for a Writers Guild Award for your comedy special, Red, Blue, Green. Uh, the special gets really personal as you unpack a lot of mental health issues. Uh, did you always know you wanted to go in this direction when you started working on the material for it? Um, well, you know, it, it, that's kind of always been a direction that I've gone with, uh, with material. So, you know, if you, if you're, you know, most people are not, but if you're familiar with my past work, it, it, it's, it's not going to come as like a huge surprise that I go in any direction that I go in. I think, um, whether it's mental health or, you know, personal issues that I struggle with, that's always been a big uh, impetus for writing the material in the first place. And also like more of the sort of, uh, you know, emotional catalyst to even get on stage in the first place is that the things that I'm trying to tackle um, kind of drive maybe the need, or if I'm being kinder to myself, the desire to, to perform and to express these things. And so, you know, um, I, I, I hope to do it in a way that, you know, translates to something enjoyable or at least rewarding uh, for the audience, whether it's, you know, funny or interesting or a combination of both. Um, and, you know, in addition to having this personal material, it's also in, in a lot of ways really deconstructing 
you know, what, you know, the, how comedy works, how it's used uh, 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 and how it uh, operates for you. Uh, and I was just talking with John about constructing a mystery. And I feel like, like a stand-up special like this requires that much attention to like structure and, 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 and how you build it and pace it and, you know, develop it. Like, did, did this uh, have a really strong impact on how you see that process because you're commenting on it so much? Uh, you're asking if the process itself has an impact on the process? Uh, well, yeah, like if making this show uh, like has has really like made you key into that sense of how like comedy is is made and and uh, structured. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I I've been doing stand up for you know over a decade, and so I, when you do something, whatever it is, you just become aware of the mechanics of it, whether it's explicit or implicit. You know, whether you you know actively go out of your way to learn what are the mechanics of the, of this thing, or if you just kind of pick it up through, you know, the, as a byproduct of just doing it so often, being around it so often, you start to see the patterns, you start to see not just the patterns in joke structure, but also maybe the patterns in uh, theme and approach. And um, yeah, so, and also in yourself, like my own patterns, my own tendencies. And I'm always trying to go against stuff that feels comfortable for me. Um, you know, if, if, if I figure something out, like a formula that kind of works, I kind of want to do something else, if that makes sense, structurally, if we're talking structurally. So there are certain joke patterns that I think I've sort of figured out that I try to veer away from if I can. And so, you know, but but you, you hit it on the head. I mean, the structure of this, the, 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 the major arc of this special was something that was always in mind as I was developing it and as I was, you know, touring and doing doing the hour live um, throughout uh, six months of, of the past year. And then there was a year before um, before the pandemic where I was touring as well. And so, uh, yeah, it's, you know, structure is definitely a, a, huge, a huge piece and awareness of structure. It, it becomes another valid piece of, 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 of something to comment on, whether it's not, you know, we're making observations and commenting on them, whether it's, you know, something kind of banal in society, you know, why do we all stand this way when we're doing it or whatever, or if it's like something you notice in yourself, like how come I keep getting into this type of relationship? You know, like, like those are the same types of observations, just like maybe on a different scale of, of depth. And then the same could be said about like, oh, how come comedy always goes this way? And there's, there's usually a reason for it. And there's, there's similarities and observations to make about the thing you're doing that I think at this point, it's so ubiquitous, people, people can relate, like people can understand it. It's not just for the back of the room. Uh, and how long does it you know, take to, to write uh, or develop a piece of, of, of standup like this? Or is it always evolving you know, while you're touring it along the way too? Yeah, I mean, you, you, you kind of decide when it's done. It's not ever done. You just have to decide. Otherwise, it would, you know, basically structure and boundaries, like impose structure and boundaries, whether it's by a network or, you know, just your own production schedule. It's like with, without that, you're just Synecdoche, New York. Like, like every artist would be Kate and Kotar if they didn't have someone being like, no, this is due next Friday and then there is no anything after that otherwise we'd kill we'd keep adding you know things and, and so um you know eventually it got to a place where I think I was maybe uh, ready to move on from it and that's how I kind of know that it's ready to be filmed this is like I, I don't have the same uh, I'm not connected to the material the same way as I was when it first when I first was doing it or earlier in the process. And so when I start to find myself like slightly disconnecting and you're trying to hit that window of like still connected to it, but it's mature enough to where it can be, uh, you know, uh, recorded and published. And so, you know, I, the, the hour was developed in about six months, but then they took another six months to like get it to where it was felt like a complete show. And then after the pandemic, I took after but like mid <laughs> during the nice reprieve we had for a minute um I took another six months to kind of like polish it and obviously some new things had had entered into it because it had been a year so it, it, there's no rhyme or there's no uh you know there's no rule to it um it's just kind of like when it's ready you know I'm, I'm usually just inspired by a collection of ideas and something I'm trying to express and so when that feels realized, or at least as much as I can get it, then 
I'll, I'll usually try to record it in some fashion. Uh, and you also directed uh, this special. Uh, what was what were the thoughts going in, uh, into like marrying the way the special looks and and you know, the way it's staged uh, mm -hmm. to the material in it? Yeah, um, you know, I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. So that was a leap of faith that I took, just because I knew no one would care as much as I do. And and you know, whatever whatever trenches exist. Uh, when you wear the director's hat, whether it's the editing room or the pre-production or just conceptual visualizing, I knew that even if I wasn't going to do it as well as someone else might have, no one would do it. No one would be willing to expand the energy that, that I was going to be willing to expand. So it was just something, you know, an artistic way I wanted to take on the challenge. You know, I felt like a stand-up special has a little bit of a, uh, a, a, you know, soft landing spot or a net in the sense that the, it's so established as a format and there's not 360 degrees of freedom, really. Like there still is some basic principles that kind of are default and you can kind of manipulate those principles and modify them. Obviously you can, there is freedom to explore, but you know, we, I wanted to shoot this more traditionally, um, but with, you know, a cinematic flair and sort of a, a harken some of the, some of the places where the standup that I look up to, um, began and where those in uh, you know the, 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 this, this special is very much about influences uh, not just artistic and comedic but you know definitely those but also familial and cultural and and then yeah people who influence me artistically and so I wanted to kind of simultaneously uh, pay homage to those influences while also maybe finding like a, a, a healthy repudiation of some of them because you know I, I i've observed maybe some of the more toxic elements of them or you know the more fatalist uh progressions of them if that makes any sense and the same can be said about cultural influences or or familial influences where you know you're, you're kind of a product or a byproduct of your own influences but at the same time sometimes you recognize that those influences are loaded with you know some some dangerous elements and so it's kind of up to you as an individual um, to to break free of the parts of those that you feel are driving you in a, in a in a direction you don't like, and then also there's also like a reverence for it because it is what made you, you know. And so it's it's kind of that duality, the tension there that I was trying to play with in in, in the material, obviously, but that was also part of the visual element. Uh, and what are some of the uh, you know the comedians or or writers or or, or artists who have uh, inspired and influenced your work? Who, who are some of them? Mm -hmm. uh, if, well, if we're talking strictly stand-up, I mean, I, I'm influenced by, you know, authors and musicians and filmmakers and, um, but, you know, I'm definitely like, I, I'm kind of a, a, a classic, a classicist in the sense of like, I'm inspired by you know, there's a lineage of, you know, Lenny Bruce and Bill Hicks and people like that, that kind of, I, I connected to spiritually, even if, you know, each iteration of those people was, was from a different era and I couldn't necessarily access the sort of like cultural reference frame that they were speaking from. But um, spiritually, I, I identified uh, certainly with them and, and they, they both, you know, they died young. Uh, Lenny Bruce died in his early 40s, I believe, from, you know, heroin and then, you know, Bill Hicks in his early 30s from from pancreatic cancer. I mean, I, I don't know, you know, that could that could be freak genetics. That could also be, he, you know, had a harsh lifestyle and, you, you know, you know, but either way, it's like they lived hard and I thought they were brilliant. But I thought like that the tragedy for both of them is that, you know, they didn't get to live long enough to grow out of some of the things that maybe plague them. And, and who knows if they ever would have, but they were denied the opportunity. And so a, a, as I am not dead, I feel like, you know, it would be a mistake for me to just kind of continue plowing ahead on a certain path. You know, because I think there's a lot of overlap between a style, you know, artistic style and like sort of like a, a general genre and also and also lifestyle. I don't think that it's a clean break from offstage and on. And so I, I think that there, you know, a lot of stand up uh, can be used if you're eloquent, if you're like, you know, if you can do it, you can use it to kind of invert, you know, some of the mistakes that you've made as heroic, you know, like you can, you can kind of 
uh, you know, invert sadness and invert uh, uh, fear into heroism or into something that's lauded. And I think that that's a very dangerous slope to kind of slide down because you're ultimately not challenging yourself to work out of this sort of um, cycle that gets you into these things in the first place because it's being kind of externally validated and internally validated. And so just recognizing that and recognizing that pattern in the people that I, that I've looked up to artistically and, 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 and saying like, you know, I, I, that's something that I don't want. I don't want to get caught in the same prison as that, that, that they seem to have been. And so, but that's also my observation. I'm not saying that they actually were, but the, as I see it. Uh, well, I want to congratulate you again on your uh, Writers Guild nomination uh, and uh, congratulations on the special. It's been a pleasure talking about it. Daniel, thank you so much. I appreciate you taking the time to, to ask those questions. Ashley Lyle, uh, you co-created Yellow Jackets uh, for which the Writers Guild has nominated you and your writing team uh, for two awards. Uh, this show is about a girls high school soccer team that's stranded in the wilderness in 1996. And then we see what's happening with them uh, in the present day, uh, 2021. Uh, how challenging is it to write characters in two different time periods with all that character development in between that you're fleshing out as the story progresses? I would say in incredibly challenging. <laughs> I feel like the theme of this panel so far has been that writing is very difficult, and um, I absolutely second that notion. Um, yeah, I mean, there were many, many times over the course of writing the first season that that Bart, um, my husband and co-creator, and Jonathan, our, our show running partner, looked at each other and said, why did we do this? Why on earth did we bite all of this off? Um, so yeah, I mean, I think for us, first and foremost, the real challenge was with this large of a cast, you know, kind of taking the two timelines aside. We wanted to make sure that that each and every one of our characters had, you know, what we would talk about a lot in the writer's room was, was giving them all the dignity of a point of view. And so we wanted to make sure that no matter how large or small a role that they played in this first season, that we were kind of creating fully formed people I, I always think of them as people and not characters, which is weird because they are very much fictional characters. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was it was a huge challenge. And um, I assume it will continue to be a big challenge as we move forward. Uh, and, you know, as you mentioned, having uh, so many characters past and present to to juggle on the show, like what's the organization process like? Do you have like like boards with like, you know, the, the cork boards with the conspiracy theorist string connecting everything and everyone. We did, I, we used Miro this season, which was very new. I, I had never done a Zoom room before this room. And so um, not, not the biggest fan of having to do everything over Zoom, but I guess the one, the one silver lining was that we did discover that Miro was great in terms of just um, having infinite whiteboard, you know, that's, that's sort of the premise of it. And there was a lot of, you know, colors, you would color code everything. And then we've got lines drawn, you know, it, it kind of ended up looking like a crazy murder board. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, the, our process was we would talk about the two timelines separately because we really always talked about them happening in the present tense, you know, in each story, it was also, you know, in production when we first shot the pilot, we had a lot of discussions with Karin, who is our pilot director. And, you know, we said we didn't want to do the thing where we put a filter on the past. You know, we didn't want to give it that visual tinge of, of nostalgia necessarily, because to our minds, both of these stories are happening in tandem and they're informing each other. Um, so we would very much um, break both sides of the story, we would talk about them separately. Then we would talk about how they are in dialogue with each other. And then we would, you know, break the stories and, and card them and, and weave them all together and just try to, you know, really it comes down to instinct as a group as to, you know, if they are working well structurally with each other. Uh, and, and what interested you in, in telling this kind of Lord of the Flies kind of story uh, with this uh, group of, of women, which is the main uh, difference between that and you know the Lord of the Flies story we're, we're used to hearing? 
Yeah, you know, I, I feel like it's become very de rigueur to, to, you know, gender flip traditional stories. And, you know, I think sometimes that's really interesting. Sometimes it feels like it's just kind of, you know, a thing that you can do. But to our minds with this one in particular, we had been working on, Bart and I had been working on Narcos and um, we were really, it was a great experience. We love being in that writer's room. Uh, but, you know, it's it's a world that is sort of defined by machismo. And we were really interested in telling a story about women. And, you know, Lord of the Flies is interesting because Golding, when he wrote that novel, it was really about how socialization falls away. You know, the, the niceties of society and how we as people are, are perhaps using them as as a mask or as, you know, sort of a guiding principle to repress sort of our more, uh, you know, our darker instincts. But to my mind, women are so much more powerfully socialized than, than men are and than boys are. And so to explore the way that that might fall away, it, it felt like there was a purpose to making these characters women and teenage girls. Uh, and you know, how much of the story uh, is is mapped out? I've, I've heard you have like a five season plan for the show. Is that, you know, does that continue evolving as you progress or is, is there sort of, you know, you know, the you know, the end point? Every, I mean, everything evolves. I will say that we deeply regret ever publicly saying that we had a five season plan because, of course, then people go, do they really? And what, you know, are they going to drag it out? And, um, so there's a little bit of regret in, in stating that publicly, but, you know, as I think everyone on this panel understands when you're pitching a show, you know, you really have to prove that you have, that your story has legs, that, that you have places you can go. Um, so we do have a plan and we've talked about what each season would be and, and we do have an end point in mind. But of course, you know, when you get in the room and you have all these other brilliant writers you know, what we find is that it's great to have a direction that you're going, but you have to be flexible enough to let better ideas prevail. So I would say, you know, even in the first season, we had um, certain ideas that we knew we wanted to get to, you know, Jackie's death was something that we pitched in the original pitch for the show. And we knew that that was um, her death and, and her friendship with Shauna was going to be, you know, kind of the, the narrative skeleton of the, of the first season. But there are a lot of discoveries that you find along the way. And so, you know, our goal is always to let the best idea win. Um, and you, you, you're telling a mystery story uh, and this mystery uh, has this, this kind of long kind of growth and evolution over uh, the course of multiple seasons. Um, like how much do the actors know? And, and uh, like if you're, you know, if the actors don't know everything of the future of the show, like how do you, kind of bring that authenticity to their characters and performances when you know more than they know? It, it was really interesting because our actors have very different styles and, and um, processes. And so certain members of our cast, like Melanie Linsky, wanted to know everything. So she really grilled us early on. And um, I guess we gave her good enough answers because <laughs> she signed on for the show. Um, whereas, you know, Tawny Cypress, for example, her, her thing was that she only wanted to know what her character knew. So um, we were, we had to kind of adjust in terms of what we were telling different people. And of course, you know, there were a lot of theories running rampant amongst the cast, amongst the crew. Um, we were, you know, constantly being, uh, you know, confronted with different theories and just being like, you're going to have to watch, you have to wait and see, wait for the scripts. And, you know, it's also interesting as writers, because as, as you know, the, the story can change even over the course of a season. So we, we wanted to give our actors enough information that they had that, you know, to inform their performance. But at the same time, you never want to make a promise that you're not going to keep, you know, so sometimes the details may change and you don't want to throw somebody completely off by having told them that something was going to happen and then it shifts in some you know, small way or, or larger way that then they go, what happened to that? So, you know, it is a little bit of a balancing act, but we never want to hide anything from our, from our cast. You know, that's not the way we operate. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a process for all of us. And how, how do you decide what to reveal and what to keep from the audience? Uh, you know, cause you know, over the course of the season, you had a lot of 
mysteries and cliffhangers that were introduced in uh, the first season finale, uh, you know, also a lot of question questions answered. How do you balance that? I mean, if, if, if I knew I would be a different person, I think, you know, again, you have to go by feel and, you know, it's, whenever you're creating a mystery, you're, you're really walking a, a tightrope because if it's too obscure or if you hide the ball too much, and then the answers to the questions you're posing come out of left, left field, it feels incredibly unsatisfying. But if you make it too obvious and you plant too many clues, it's also unsatisfying. So you're trying to find a way. And, and it's interesting, you know, watching viewers watch the first season. Um, it was fascinating to see what they latched onto very quickly and what they did figure out very quickly. And then other things that, that they didn't, you know, actually kind of focus on as much. And so, you know, I, I know that we had even kind of played in the room with, we talked a lot about trying to put the viewers in the subjective viewpoint of our characters. And part of that, because these are women who, you know, went through an in incredibly traumatic experience, you know, we wanted that, that sort of paranoia and the sort of false pattern recognition to be something that our audience was experiencing as well. And one thing we had talked about was the character of Adam and who he might be and, and we always knew that we wanted him to be sort of the wrong, the, you know, a person who's just simply in the wrong place at the wrong time and falls in love with the wrong woman. Um, but we had talked about, you know, what if the audience thinks that he could be Javi grown up? And, you know, we, we kind of toyed with that, but we thought it would be a really obscure um, concept. And then by episode three, you know, Reddit was like, it's Javi, it's gotta be Javi. And we were like, whoa, we did not see them coming to that conclusion that quickly. Um, so yeah, you know, we just tried our best to create a mystery that was compelling and that, that sometimes, you know, we felt like the simplest answer was actually the correct answer. Um, and so we, you know, but at the same time, if it's always that way, you're going to really, you know, your audience is going to get ahead of you. So I think we'll continue to be striking that balance always. Uh, well, congratulations on your Writers Guild nominations uh, and the first season of the show and the second season of the show that you've been renewed for. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you about it. Thank you, you too. I'm Gold Derby editor, Daniel Montgomery, here with writers Sarah Burgess from American Crime Story Impeachment, uh, Drew Michael from his comedy special, Red, Blue, Green, Carrie Aaron from The Morning Show, John Hoffman from Only Murders in the Building, and Ashley Lyle from Yellow Jackets. Uh, now you're all uh, nominated for Writers Guild Awards this year. Uh, what's the significance for you of not just being recognized by your fellow actors in the industry, or fellow writers in the industry, but to be supported by this labor union uh, uh, in that sense. Uh, Ashley, how about you? I mean, this, we were so over the moon by these um, nom nominations just because I feel like other writers' opinions are the ones that end up sort of mattering the most because your peers are the people who, who really understand how difficult this is and to be recognized by other writers is just such an honor. Um, and I, I mean, I love the Guild. Um, you can look at my Twitter and there's a lot of tweets about how much I love being a part of this Guild and how much I, I support them and, and feel supported by them. And I think that, you know, even in the past couple of years, we've really proven how incredibly powerful a collective of writers can be in this industry. And I think that's really important. So it's just thrilling. How about you, Drew? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, it, I don't even know really how this happened. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Cause like, I, I think I tried to vote for me, but couldn't figure out how. <laughs> and so I don't know how enough people did to get me to this spot, but I, I, I am appreciative. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of of two minds about it. I mean, in this, in the special, I have like a six minute kind of like complaint about the pageantry of award shows in general. And so the, there's this weird sort of pressure on me, right? I, I'm not, I'm not unappreciative. Of course, I'm appreciative of the fact that, that people took the time to a watch it at all and respond well to it and then take the time to you know make the the, the choice to to vote for it in in this um 
you know, for, for this award. And so like, obviously very appreciative of that. And, you know, I know that the people that I sort of represent, the people who are behind this, the people that work tirelessly on this, you know, like I'm one of a hundred people, you know, the people at the network, they're all very excited about it. And they, they, so this makes them very happy. And I, so I'm, I am happy for everyone to be recognized, but I also, you know, I do think awards, you know, whatever. My thoughts on awards are are documented, so I won't have to say them here. But <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, thank you, but also like, we don't need to, <laughs> we don't need to do all this. But also thanks, and mostly thanks for uh, the health insurance. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that, that does sound like a very, very good aspect of it. Uh, <laughs> uh, how about you, Carrie? Yeah, yeah I mean, it's it's honestly, it really um, it, it caught me by surprise and it was really uh, moving to me. I've been in this business a long time and, um, you know, you're, I, lo I love writers, like writers, th those are my happy places, you know, like a good raucous writer's room is one of the greatest places on earth. Um, and, you know, I totally, I totally hear you about uh, the awards thing. <laughs> <laughs> and I and I have to say like this because it's just because it's writers. It's like it's very meaningful. It's very it, it really it surprised me and it and it um it 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 melted my heart a little to be totally corny. It did. Sarah. Um, yeah. I mean, look, I agree about like you have to be so careful about not needing outside validation and listening to whatever crazy ideas you have in your own head. But of course, uh, on that day, it meant everything to me. And I, you know, I'm obsessed with the opinions. It, it is really true that you care the most about what other writers say about your work. If I hear like fifth hand, what somebody said about one of my plays, I will think about it. I mean, I had a play done like six and a half years ago. I'm thinking about a stray comment. I heard somebody said that somebody else overheard. So this just meant the world to me. I was um, really surprised and while yes, the, the part of my, you know, brain is like, you need to sort of shut out all external commentary. Um, it just meant, I, I remember I, like where I was standing on Howard Street when I got a text from somebody congratulating, like the first text or whatever from someone saying, uh, and um, I was just so happy, which is like very rare for me. So uh, it meant everything. John? Same, I, uh, I feel the same about everything, about everything. <laughs> I think um, it's a mixed bag with all of it, but it, it 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 it's very bracing when you hear that and and you feel that um, and and I think it has to do all the all the ways with the respect. I I I was very happy because at the moment when I heard about it, I didn't know it was the day they were going to be announced and all of that, and I was in, actually in a production meeting, and I had some of my writers in the on the Zoom in this massive Zoom and everything, but. Um, so it caught me completely off guard and, um, I've only had a few moments to get corny, but it only had a few moments like that where, you know, you're on this train and you're, everybody knows this thing we have to do and you're focused on this thing. And then when something like that happens, it really does stop the room for me. And, uh, the big moment was running downstairs on the set. And I thought I was going to tell Steve Martin this lovely news and, um, and before I could say anything, he had his hand up and he looked like I hadn't seen him. And he was like, hey, and uh, that melted my heart. Um, it's all lovely relief acknowledgement that you don't think to dwell in. Um, so it's lovely. And I think also what you're saying about the guild and the collective nature of the power of the writers of course, I was feeling that in the opposite direction this morning because Marty Short, whose trailer I'm in right now, is going to make a guest appearance. Hello. He hated me. <laughs> he hated me this morning because of one line I wrote for him. And he was Where's upset it? that he couldn't. Well, it made no sense. It was like gibberish. <laughs> where's, the, uh, where's, the musical... sa where's the sandwich? <laughs> sandwich is over there. The musical, what was it? Um, no, don't say it. Musical. No, don't spoil it. Chinese. <laughs> yeah, it's, you made it say Chinese. Yeah. But, um, no. It was bad. It was four words that made no sense. And be... that's where you hate a writer. 
<laughs> anyway, love to see you. <laughs> Thank you for the trailer visit. <laughs> He's wrapped. He's all done. He got the line. He nailed it. <laughs> he got the line. <laughs> uh, so, so what is it like getting notes from 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 actors live on Zoom? <laughs> Kevin, in this case, yeah, uh, yeah, and uh, I did. Yeah. I you know, TV, uh, uh, you know, to a large part uh, for, you know, you know, for most of you is, is a very collaborative process, uh, but, you know, writing, uh, you know, often is, is like a solitary thing. It's one, you know, person, their thoughts in front of a computer or, you know, typewriter or, you know, uh, you know, piece of parchment, whatever time period you're in. Um, uh, so, so, like, do you, is there something about working in a team, like, that you prefer to working alone, or do you, like, solitary more than times you've worked with teams. Uh, John, how about you? Uh, it's surprising. I always, I wrote a long time uh, as a screenwriter. And so I got very in the mode of writing a lot. And um, I, uh, and so I, I became enamored with that and protective of that little cocoon and like thinking I could only write when I was like that. So I was actually late coming to work in television. It's uh, probably the last 10 years that I've been working in television and and I was nervous to come into a writer's room because, you know, if, if I was doing anything with a slight comedic bent, I was terrified of a, you know, of a room of, you know, joke, brilliant geniuses. And I was like, I, I'm not that guy. I'm a, I'm a little different that way. Um, and so I was intimidated by it. But I, I found my way in and, and grew to love, appreciate, like, it's amazing when you're um, getting better and being made better by other brilliant minds and and also just the room itself the experience we've been a zoom room since the beginning on this show um i've we all have mixed feelings about that but it is also interesting because it's created this new level of connection that's very specific and um intimate in a way uh and focused um but otherwise uh yeah i i i found my own growing pains and things like that and sort of finding my way towards uh, writing with a bigger group, but also right on the other side of it, loving every minute of that. Sarah? Oh man, I mean, yeah, this is the only time I've ever done it. I'm a playwright. I've always just kind of a creepy person alone in a room. So I too had growing pains around this, but you know, by the end of it, I was like hiding in my car at Fox calling Flora Birnbaum, who's a brilliant, brilliant um, young writer we had in our room because I was like struggling with this thing in episode 10 and like to sort of, I had never collaborated with a writer like that. Someone else who just had been on the whole thing with me and is so smart and would push back against me. And um, it really has changed how I think about writing at least some things to, to let another writer into my very unfortunate mental space like that. And to rely on her and need to call this person who I'd never met before this, who I met when I read like her brilliant pilot and was like, well, I'd love to hire this person. Um, so it's been, it's changed me in some ways and changed how I think about writing, certainly at least for, for certain types of TV. Absolutely. Gary? I mean, it, it, it completely depends on the people. It's, it's, I, you know, I've been, I've been in amazing rooms um, where it was really clicking. I've been in rooms where it was like a bad date. Um, and, and it, you know, it's, it's, it really is like having, having us, a, a, being inspired by someone and clicking with them mentally is such a magical thing. And when it happens, it's, it's amazing. And um, really from a person who, who sort of suffers from uh, chronic loneliness, not for any reason. I mean, there's people all over the place <laughs> just, just because uh, I live inside of myself, but it is, it is one of the most, amazing experiences to emotionally and mentally connect with someone over a creative venture. Uh, it's, it's, it's high on my list. I highly recommend it. Uh, and Drew, obviously stand up is more of a solitary, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, creative process, but you've also worked on uh, SNL where you were part of a writing team. Yeah, it was a long time ago. I, I'm just hearing people humble brag about the fact they have people around them. 
um you know m- yeah my my process is like uh pacing around my apartment and screaming at myself um and hopefully some of that's usable like no i i i had i had well also and 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 to carry your your you said you live inside yourself i think that's just implied by being here right like i don't know a lot of extroverted writer like it's not like what an extra like there's no life of the party <laughs> writer um but i had so yeah I, I worked on i worked on snl for uh one one season it was the election the 2016 election season and i i i only lasted one year so you can maybe ascertain how collaboration goes for me but um <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, I had people, I had uh, a few friends, producer uh, on, on, the, on the, the project with me where I was kind of checking in with them to just, you know, help shape it. But yeah, for the most part, it was, stand-up is very solitary, for better or for worse. You know, it's, it's singular in that sense. You don't have like the clutter of, of potentially too many visions driving. And obviously, you know, there's a hierarchy with, with structured shows like that you're all working on where someone is maybe more primarily responsible for that but in this sense it's like literally all that but there's also the pushback is coming from uh the audience mostly and then your own internal uh the past that you have lived that is tormenting you to this day um and so a a lot of the times the you know you're just kind of trying to balance like those elements just just you know in your own head which can get messy and so um yeah, I don't know if that even answers anything you asked me, but that is, those are words that I did say. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, Ashley? I mean, I guess, you know, inevitably, no matter what, there comes the moment where you're just sitting by yourself at your computer, staring at that fucking blank final draft document, which is just unequivocally the worst part of the job as far as I'm concerned that is my least favorite part and I my favorite part is the collaboration I mean I I think that maybe I'm in a unique position among this group that I've I've always been part of a writing team my my husband and I from the very beginning of our career started writing together and I we started writing together within like three weeks of dating so it's been like 16 years now um and Yeah, I mean, the writer's room is also just my happy place. I think that um, I've been very lucky in my career of of working in really great rooms that had really good dynamics. And on this show in particular, we had this great opportunity to work with um, a couple of really good friends of ours who we had known for years. And, you know, we all kind of came to L.A. together and then went off on diverging paths. And luckily, everybody's career really took off. And then to be able to come together to make this show, you know, and think back on when we had, we actually had a little writer's group um, when we were all trying to break into the industry together. It's myself and Bart, um, Liz Pong and and Omni Roja. And uh, now we're actually making a show together, which is just sort of unbelievable. Um, And then of course, you know, we brought in and found a number of writers who we're continuing to work with on season two, who are sort of part of the family now and are also good friends. And it's just, that's to me, the best part of this job. You know, we have a a features agent who like calls twice a year and says, Hey, do you want to write a screenplay? And we're like, nah, we're good. (laughs) So yeah, I mean, I, I just love it. Uh, Well, uh, thank you all for, for joining me and talking about your, your work uh, and how different it all is. And of course, congratulations and best of luck to all of you at the Writers Guild Awards. Uh, You know, it, it, it's it's always so nice to talk to such a wide range of of creative people. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks, everybody. Yeah.